Welcome everyone to my YouTube channel. My name is International Master William Pascal, and this is Video Chess Training on YouTube. Today I have found an interesting game that I'd like to share with everyone. This is from the Dubai Open 2017. This is a game between Grandmaster Vladimir Okopian, who is, well, has been one of the top players from Armenia for years now, and one of their top Olympic players and Abdel Rahman Hesham. And this is a strong tournament, the Dubai Open, where everyone has to be, I think, approximately at least 2450 ELO to even play in the tournament. So it goes without saying, uh, the, the opponent of a Kopian here has to be at least a credible, very credible 2450 at least. So from the United Arab Emirates, it's a Kopian versus Hesham. Kopian is white. E4, C5, and we'll see a Nidorf Sicilian here. Knight F3, D6, D4, C takes D, Knight takes, Knight F6, Knight to C3, and A6. Sicilian Nidorf is something that I've never actually played with black myself. And personally, I'm, I'm kind of anti-trend when it comes to openings. I try to avoid if I can kind of avoid trendy openings, or at least the main lines of trendy openings, it's it's a way of playing. Some people love to play the main, main lines. Um, I've always kind of made my living by avoiding the main lines, maybe playing side variations of good openings. For example, um, in the Sicilian, I've always tr tried to avoid playing the Nidorf. Uh, in the King's Indian, I, I avoid playing the main line Mardel Plata. But I do play the Sicilian, I do play the King's Indian, so... Just try to avoid the main lines with uh, with side variations because it takes an incredible amount of preparation to play either side of the main lines of such openings. I think the Nidorf probably, I mean, along with the Roy Lopez, probably the most theoretical opening in chess because, I mean, to a great extent, it, it was a favorite of Gary Kasparov and Robert Fisher. And because of that, I think the two most famous world champions in history um, this opening is, is super trendy. And besides that, it's just good. I mean, a6, it's not a direct move, you know, controlling the center, but it leaves black with a lot of flexibility. I was talk talking about this with one of my students this week, that uh, the advantage of the knight orf really is in its flexibility. So the black knight can go to either d7 or c6. You can set up a queenside fianchetto or keep the bishop on the diagonal where it's at. So there's a lot of, a lot of different plans available to black and wait and see what white does. Basically, a6 is a useful move. Um, anyway, so white played f3 here. This is one way of getting into what we call like the English attack type of setup. A little bit similar to, well, the Yugoslav attack against the dragon, if you will. So black has a lot of options here, which is what I'm talking about in the night or the nice thing. You have um, g6 going to a kind of dragon dwarf, if you will. Um, flexible moves like knight bd7 and queen c7 probably but I like e5 e6 knight c6 and probably queen b6 the best queen b6 is one variation I've seen a little bit of the idea of putting pressure on on the knight on d4 with the queen on b6 here uh, also putting pressure on b2 so making it difficult for um, this knight and this pawn on b2, making it difficult for white to develop the queen bishop. That's a provocative variation we could see first game here, Shirov Kasparov, so it has some pedigree. Uh, if you want an independent variation, that's that's a good place to start. Uh, knight c6 would transpose to a variation that I've played quite a bit of myself. Knight c6, bishop e3, now you can play d5. This, this is something I play coming out of the classical Sicilian a lot. Um, but it's not a it's not a cure all. I mean, white has ways to get a slightly better ending in this line. So there are different ways to approach it. Uh, I think the most principled is probably e5. Uh, the most flexible maybe e6. Those are the two moves you're going to see the most in this game. Um, I'm all uh, Abdel Rahman played e5, and then white plays knight to b3, and. This is the beginning of, of a classical situation in the Nidorf. I mean, black is gonna try to play for d5 quickly. And usually black gets in d5, he like equalizes 
in, in these knight off type of positions. But here it's not quite so simple. Um, white plays bishop e3, and we'll see. I mean, black could also play bishop e6 here. This is a little bit more common. And typically, white will play bishop to e3. And then black could play d5. Now, this is what I wanted to talk about. The actual game move order was bishop e7, bishop e3. But what I wanted to talk about was black trying to play um, d5. See here, even h5 is, has been catching on. This is an idea that uh, that is becoming more and more popular in the knight or flank, stopping white from playing g4. But it's very extreme. Um, anyway, what I wanted to talk about was d5, first of all. This kind of ending. Um, e takes d5, knight takes d5, knight takes d5, and then I guess black can take either way here. Um, I was looking at a game, I guess, queen takes d5, or bishop takes d5, both possible. But queen takes d5, queen takes d5. See the game here, Lanka played with white. Um, if you do play f3, this is uh, the kind of game you'll get. Castles, and then it's just a slightly better end game. This this kind of position, like bishop e6, now knight c5. This is a bravo with Mamadov. Notice how black held on um, in this game. Bishop takes c5. Bishop takes c5. I mean, I found a lot of examples like this where basically white is slightly better with the two bishops, but you know, black could probably defend if he plays, if he defends perfectly. It's just, it's very unpleasant. So this is why in most cases, a black doesn't play an early d5. It usually leads to a kind of favorable ending. Um, in this case, bishop e7 first, bishop e3. And now once again, you could play d5, bishop e6, queen d2, and then Again, d5 is possible. Here is an example, another example, similar position. There's Shirov Lobojevic. You might want to take a look at this. E takes d5, knight takes d5, knight takes d5. This is just analysis. Um, and now queen takes d5, similar to the last example. Queen takes d5, bishop takes d5, and then c4, I think, was played in one game. This is... Uh, reasonable, but castle's queen side is more of a developing move, and this this is following the shirov Lubojevic game. So once again, black gives up the white square to bishop on b3, white has a kind of static advantage, or bishop e6, and now there is an interesting game here with knight a5, we have knight a5, b5, this is shirov Lubojevic, bishop d3, all very natural moves, I think, for both sides, rook h e1, and then just an example, Lubojevic held on here. So it's not that simple. Knight to d7, knight to c6. All the moves seem very logical to me. And uh, and then Lubojevic managing to hold a draw in this 95 game against Shirov. Rook c8, knight takes e7, king takes e7. It seems like the same thing basically happens in all these endings. That white has like the bishop pair and a slight advantage. But it might be hard for white to actually convert it to a win. So... If you do um, want to take a look at these lines with f3, you have to be ready to play some kind of ending where you only have like a small advantage. Anyway, I'm um, going back to the game. So Abdel uh, Rahman here played more aggressively, not, not going for an ending. Castles, castles, and then a5. Now let's stop here because there's a lot of theory on this position. Um, I mean, obviously there are other move orders that could reach this position. White, you know, could have like delayed f3, then like just played it now or something like that. Um, I don't know. Abdel Rahman played a5. It's the second most popular move in this position, but it's very anti-positional because black's giving up the b5 square. This square on b5 after the move a5, we play this a5 advance. We draw an arrow here. Um, the b5 square becomes very weak. So we should look for alternatives, I think, for black here. I mean, B queen c7 looks like a, a normal developing move played by Ivan Chuk. b5, a more flexible pawn advance, certainly seems like very viable. White has a superior score, but I think that should be checked out. Um, and then the developing move knight on bd7. This is probably going into like the main, main line. If we look here, 4,000 games with g4. So this this is something like the main, main variation. All right. Anyway, Adel Rahman played a5. 
this doesn't cause him to lose the game. I just think that it, it makes it a little easier for white to play with that weakened b5 square. The plans become very clear. Um, the main move is bishop b5. Also, a4 is possible. I would imagine even queen f2. A lot of possible moves here. Akopian knows what he's doing, though. He plays queen e1. And here is an interesting moment now. 85 games with queen c8, queen c7. And um, the engine likes queen c7 after a brief look. But Abdul Rahman played knight a6 here. Now, in any case, that knight has to be developed. More typical, you know, for the knight to go to d7 later on, I guess. But here, um, it's it's a tough call. I mean, this is by far the most heavily played move. And, I mean, maybe Abdul Rahman knew that, and maybe he just wanted to get a Copian out of the main line. Um, but that, that looks like, you know, the pedigree move for black. And according to the engine, black has pretty reasonable chances here. After something like a3, um, a3, a4. Notice that the threat is... And why queen c8? I mean, the idea is that the knight will jump from b3 to c5. And because the rook, the rook is on the d file here, along the d file, it's pressuring along the d file, the knight will go to c5, hitting the bishop on e6. That's why we need to get the queen off the file. So instead, Abdul Rahman played knight a6. This is not a bad move. It's another way of controlling c5 and stopping knight c5. So I think that it's reasonable. There's only a few games in this position. Here, Akopian played king b1, and then black played queen b8. And this move, at first glance, it looks like it's about like bringing the king's rook over to, to the c file, and also supporting b5. It's obviously hard to play hard to play b5 for black, though. So I don't know about these games here. There's one San Alvap against uh, Maurice Sibag in 2013, and the other game looks like a correspondence game to me because I don't recognize either of these names. Um, most likely correspondence. It's a very topical variation of the Nidorf. Um, the, the black player in particular, this name, Haber, I, I've never heard of this guy. So there's a lot of correspondence games here in the Lee Chess uh, opening explorer. Um, G4. So here we go. Copia knows what he's doing. Black doesn't have A4. He doesn't have B5. And the previous games, black played Knight C7 aiming for b5 and or a4. That makes a lot of sense. But instead of doing that here, I mean, I think that's probably the best move, right? Uh, instead of doing that, black played rook c8, which doesn't actually actively stop white's plan, which is to get the control of the d5 square. Black doesn't have an exchange sacrifice on c3, like in some Sicilians, and uh, I'm not really sure that rook c8 was, was necessarily the best. So now g5, and then the, the classic dilemma for black, should the knight go to h5 or d7? Knight, knight on h5 kind of slows down white's play on the king side in many instances. h4, h5 is impossible, um, and it can go to f4. But on d7, it can flow over toward the queen side and maybe help black to speed up his, his counterplay on the queen side. My opinion here is that white already has a kind of significant slight advantage. Black plays knight d7. And then Akopian plays a4. He said, okay, enough is enough. If you take on b3, we'll take with a pawn. We'll establish a bishop on c4. Black cannot afford to give up the white squared bishop, so he's not fearing. Um, bishop takes b3. Let's just take a timeout here and talk about what's going on with this position strategically. Vladimir Akopian, by playing g5, just took over the most important square on the board, the d5 square. There is one very important point in the Sicilian defense, and this is sometimes seen in other openings too, notably um, the Roy Lopez, probably, the d5 square in lines of the closed Roy Lopez can be extremely important for white to, to dominate the game. I think a really recent example of that, if you'd like to take a look, was uh, the game Kamsky versus Naroditsky from the 2017 US Championship. It was an absolute positional wipeout where it looked like, although a very strong grandmaster, this young Naroditsky seemed to lose contact with the concept of how important the d5 square really is in, in the Royal Lopez, you know, and he just lost, he just lost, uh, Kamsky was like taking candy from a baby in that game. And it's the same thing here basically happening. I mean, sometimes we get, get distracted in the heat of battle and we lose focus 
on what is really the vital strategic point in the game. Here black has lost the d5 square. The battle for the knight orf is often over that square. And Vladimir Kopian you know, came very close to winning like the, the world championship tournament. I remember in, in Las Vegas in like 1997, I think. Um, he's, he's a world-class player. He's been over 2,700. Um, and he understands chess much, much deeper than your average grandmaster. But basically, he's, he's winning this game with control of d5. And black doesn't seem to, to really realize what's happening to him here. Um, knight to b4. A little bit of counterplay along the C line and now H4 and while this looks like it's just like a standard pawn storm on the king's side um, what a copian is actually doing is is making a prophylactic move I mean H4 is useful for attack as well but most importantly he's enabling his rook to go up here to H2 and that rook will, will laterally um, both maneuver and and defend the C2 point so now Hashem has to get some counterplay. So he plays f5, and white just lets it sit. It was very, very tempting, if you look at the stockfish here, to play for bishop h3. But if white does that, he opens up a very dangerous double-edged kind of game. If white leaves the bishop on f1, he controls c4, and he controls, most importantly, b5. So he's stopping black's counterplay by playing for b5. But if he goes bishop h3, the game will go into a much wilder kind of all-out, opposite side kind of attacking position. Because black can get in b5. Something like bishop h3, b5, white might be better, but the, the sharpness level of the play would become very, very complicated. So I think that Akopian decides to just play it safe here with rook h2. And now an interesting moment. Black could have played f4 in this position, which would have essentially like locked the king's side down completely. So in retrospect, after what happens later in the game, I mean, maybe this would be a good idea to just lock up the king's side and, and nobody can make any progress for the rest of the game. I mean, it's possible um, after something like bishop g1, white has a little upper hand, but can he break through? I'm not really sure. Anyway, um, it's not really a natural positional idea, but something to think about by locking the position. If black was satisfied with the draw, say, he might be able to lock it down. Instead here, he plays rook c7. This is interesting. This is the computer's second choice. And it's not obvious what this move does. I mean, at first, it looks like you're just inviting white to play knight d5 or knight b5, and the rook looks kind of exposed on c7. But he's actually creating um, the possibility of moving his queen laterally and putting pressure on like g5 also maybe doubling rooks on the c5 so black is in an unpleasant place here he doesn't have a lot of space and a lot of counterplay um a copian kind of playing a karpovian sort of an, an old like young karpov e4 type of style like controlled um e4 game style but uh this this looks like an unpleasant situation for black i mean Rook c7 probably as good a try as anything. So, and now we see it gets worse. Knight to d5. Knight takes d5. Pawn takes d5. Black really can't afford to give up the white squared bishop. Being that most of his pawns are on dark squares. g7, e5, g7. He really needs the white squared bishop to help protect the white squares. Now, right around here, um, white starts thinking about f4. He plays f4 right away. h5 would have been possible too because this way black, you know, if he does f4, you have bishop takes f4. And I think that's gotta be just winning a pawn. So I wonder if, if it's not more accurate for a copian to play h5 first. The way he played it, he played f4, but black had time to play bishop h5, which stops his h5, slows white down a little bit. Nevertheless, I think white has the upper hand here. He could exchange white squared bishops with bishop e2, but once again, if we do that, I think that the possibility of black getting in b5 increases a little bit. So he plays rook d2, and then this bishop comes in, and I mean, you can see the Hesham is a good player, he's an active player, but slowly he runs out of, of ideas here. Um, h5, and then bishop e4, putting pressure on c2. 
H6. This move I didn't really like by Akopian. I think the only move in the entire game I would go as far as to criticize. I, I think that White doesn't have to play H6 here because if he just increases his position with something like Bishop B5 or Queen G3, you know, he might play G6 or he might play H6 at any moment. I think the ability he has to play either one of these moves at any moment, you know, why not just preserve his flexibility here is what I'm saying. So if Vladimir had played this game perfectly, which very few of us are capable of doing, he probably would, would do this like Queen G3 or something like this first, putting pressure on the center, overprotecting G5. And I think this is more flexible. By playing H6, he kind of commits himself. H6, G6, and then Bishop B5, and I'm jumping ahead here. So, nasty situation for Black. I mean, he just doesn't have any counterplay. Possibly you can kind of shift back and forth. The computer is saying Queen F8. You know, Queen F8 is a very strange move. I mean, it just, just makes a move for the sake of making a move. And Black doesn't have any forward plan here. It's an extremely difficult position for a human being to play. Because basically all Hashem can do is kind of move back and forth and keep the position and hope that White you know, makes a mistake or can't make progress. But I think this is a player who's black, who's very aggressive. He wanted to do something and he felt frustrated. Um, but his text move isn't too bad. I mean, Queen d8 puts pressure on g5. He's threatening to play pawn takes f4 and then rip off the pawn on g5 and win a pawn. But the problem is that White has Queen g3 and now we're actually breaking through on e5. So first it was a battle for d5, and now it's a battle for e5, and this is how Kopian wins the game. I mean, first of all, he, he sealed control of d5. He's now got a space advantage with the pawn on d5. Now he wins control of e5. He's starting to take out that knight on d7, and then maybe win the pawn on e5. Black has a little bit of counterplay, rook a c8, but guess what? You know, c2 is protected, and Kopian just calls his bluff here. Knight takes a5. And this is the, the key moment in the game where it looks like Hesha missed his only chance. Um, he would have been slightly worse, but the only chance was to play rook takes c2, rook takes c2, rook takes c2. It's a forced variation. Rook takes c2. And then you don't have to take right away on c2 check. It's pinned. So queen takes a5. And now I guess bishop takes um, d7. For example, bishop takes c2 check, king takes c2, queen c7 check, king b3, and then queen takes d7. Now this is a technical ending where white stands a little bit better. And that, that might seem strange at first glance because the material is even, but black's king is hemmed in and the white king is relatively safe with his space advantage. And I think that with really good technique, um, it's possible that White's queenside pawn majority, these two pawns, in the hands of a great player like Kopian, um, these two pawns have a, a, a much greater chance of scoring a goal than Black's pawn majority on the king side. It looks like White has a good blockade. The queen, the White queen, will come back, you know, into g2, e2, swing over to the queen side. Um, worst case scenario, like trade itself off for the Black queen. I mean, I think that White has chances here with a clear advantage in the ending. But this is really, really Hesham's only chance. And I think probably being an active player, he didn't want to, uh, to trade down into a slightly worse ending. I mean, who does? But he disintegrated here um, with another move. But there really isn't another move. You know, that's the problem with Black's position. I mean, White is just going to improve. So pawn takes f4, and he loses the e5 strong point. And that's it. I mean, the game is largely about the center, you know, to the chess game. And, and Black lost d5, and now he loses e5. And, and eventually, everything falls apart. I mean, it looks easy in the hands of a world-class player like Vladimir Kopian. But honestly, I mean, this just was a really difficult game for Black. You know, he can't be criticized too much for not playing perfectly. So he tries knight b6, and then... Um, Queen e3. This is a merciless move. This is where you see how strong not only is, is a Kopian, like, let's say, strategically, but he's a very strong player tactically. I mean, he does not miss any kind of tactical concept that's fairly obvious. Here, it's a, it's a multi-level um, tactical idea. Like, if you play bishop takes d5, bishop takes d5, 
we just have rook takes d5 and then knight takes d5 and queen e6 check <laughs> which is devastating so black loses everything and then the other way this works is if you take with a knight knight takes d5 i'm assuming queen b3 um, is is very good the computer was talking about something else here i mean queen b3 is enough we're just going to play rook takes d5 but according to the engine it even has rook takes d5 now i missed this Rook takes d5, bishop takes d5, ah, and mate, look at that mate on g7, so a double attack, threatening d5, threatening mate on g7, the pawn on h6, Vladimir Kopian knows, <laughs> coming in handy finally, um, I like h6, but I just, I was a little bit skeptical of whether he played it in the right moment or not, you know, maybe it was better to be more flexible, in retrospect it looks good, but black had that chance to liquidate, so after queen e3 it's over, um, he does try the best chance here, knight d7, and then um, you'll see the end here pretty quickly. Queen d4 threatening mate. Very unpleasant situation. Knight e5. Bishop takes e5, d takes e5, and queen takes e5. There's, <laughs> He's won the center, man. I mean, white has one control the center. Every square, three out of four squares. That's not bad, right? Black controls e4. White has e5, d5, and d4. Chess is a game of principles, you know, and 99% of the time those principles hold true. There are exceptions, but this this is not one of them. Um, black has just not enough control of the center now. Bishop d6, queen e6 check, and the king is in danger. King h8, and now a very beautiful kind of uh, finish here, centralizing this last piece with rook there. White is up two pawns in this position. I mean, it's pretty hefty. Solid two pawns with very good control, very active pieces. Um, it's important that rookie seven, we have queen f6 check, of course. And that's that's rather key. That's the game. Rookie seven, queen f6 check, king g8. And now, of course, the routine knight to c4 would have been enough for white. But Akopian finishes here with a very beautiful move. Knight to c6, forking the rook on e7 and the queen on d8. And if you take, you just open up the floodgates along the d-file and black is just utterly paralyzed so there is no move for black in this position and he's according to the engine he's down like six points of material he's going to be down the exchange and two pawns at best in this situation so i don't usually play um these topical main lines of the nidorf and i don't don't play the nidorf as well but i really really thought that this was one of the more like beautiful and kind of like instructive games that I've seen in a long time on the white side of one of these f3 bishop e3 type of nightorfs. So I hope you enjoyed it again. Vladimir Akopian versus Abdel Rahman Hesham from the the 2017 Dubai Open. Um, I don't know what happened to, to Vladimir Akopian in, in the end because he he did not finish in the top uh, of, of the event so perhaps he got sick or just had a really really bad um, second half of the tournament, but Akopian did not finish among the top players in this event, surprisingly. Uh, after a, a good start and a couple of good games, I saw he won another really nice Karo Khan with white in another uh, early round, but who knows, you know, he could have been ill or something like that. Anyway, thanks for joining me here at my video chess training channel. Don't forget to subscribe and like this video and uh, join our channel. So thanks again. We will be back with another video next week. Bye-bye.